Welcome, NE204, to this review lecture, where what we'll do today is think about some of the material we've covered so far in the first half of this course in preparation for the exam, which will happen on Wednesday. So, our philosophy in this course involved a three-pronged approach to computational neuroscience. These three prongs consisted of data, the things we observe from the brain, analysis, ways to characterize these data in quantitative ways, and models, mathematical statements we can use to express, for example, how a single neuron behaves. Now these three different prongs are interrelated. We use data to motivate the types of models that we build, and then these models will ideally help us motivate experiments. And this data analysis often sits somewhere in between. We can use this data analysis to summarize features we observe in the data, and maybe this will help us inform the types of models that we construct. We began this semester by thinking about neural data recorded at various scales. We thought about examples of brain structure, for example, diffusion tensor imaging, where we get these beautiful pictures of the white matter tracks between brain areas. We also thought, looked at examples of brain function, and these could range from single cell recordings, where a tiny electrode is used to stick an individual neuron and action potentials are recorded, all the way up to entire brain observations, for example, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Throughout this first half of the semester, we focused in particular on a specific experiment in which we imagined a collaborator recording the activity from a single neuron. For example, this collaborator can stick an electrode into the hippocampus and record the activity from a single hippocampal neuron. We might call this the patched neuron. And then, this very talented electrophysiologist is able to observe a particular feature of this neuron, its spiking activity. Here's an example of the spiking activity where we're plotting in this figure the voltage as a function of time. And one conclusion we can draw immediately from visual inspection is that this activity is rather complicated. It consists of these rapid increases and decreases in voltage that appear maybe to occur consistently in time, although there is lots of variability. So to simplify these data, we considered two abstract representations of spiking. Instead of looking at these traces of voltage versus time, as we have here at the top of the figure, we replaced it with a series of tick marks, where each of these individual slashes or tick marks corresponds to a spike. Or, instead of using this graphical representation of spiking, we can represent this as a series of zeros or ones, where we think of these zeros or ones as occurring in little time bins. If no spike occurs in a time bin, we represent that as a zero, but when a spike occurs, we represent that with a one. Now typically, in the types of experiments that we considered, we thought about data collected in multiple trials. So for example, we can imagine in our first trial, a stimulus is presented to a neuron, and the spiking activity is recorded as a function of time, where here we observe this series of spikes. If then the stimulus is presented again to the same neuron at some later time, we observe another set of spikes occurs, as we can see here in the second trial. If we repeat this experiment a third time, we've delivered this, uh, this exact same stimulus to the exact same neuron, and we get slightly different spiking activity as a function of time. And we can repeat this procedure over and over again, perhaps collecting K trials, capital K trials, from this individual neuron, where again, we're recording from the same neuron each time, we're presenting the same stimulus each time, and we're looking at the, uh, the spiking activity that results. Let's, for concreteness, say that we record this activity for a half second. So we'll set this big T equal to 0.5 seconds. And we thought about different ways to analyze these data using a variety of different techniques. And let's remember what some of those techniques are now. So what are some of the quantitative characterizations of spike train data that we considered? We focused on five different measures. The spike number histogram, the firing rate, the inner spike interval histogram, the rastogram, and the post-stimulus time histogram, or PSTH. And let's review each of these five measures. Let's begin by considering the spike number histogram. Well, remember, the idea of the spike number histogram is to count the occurrences of the number of spikes, which we label little n, in a trial. Let's consider some examples of this simple counting process. So we take the data from our first trial, the spiking activity following the stimulus, and we count the number of tick marks or spikes. In this case, let's label that n sub 1, where the 1 is to remind us that this is the first trial, and we observe that there are 15 spikes. We can then repeat this process for the second trial. We count the number of spikes that occur in this interval. We get 13 spikes. 
third trial, 12 spikes, and so on, all the way up to the last trial. So in doing this, we establish this collection of counts, where we get a different count for each trial. Then, in the spike number histogram, we'd like to visualize these counts. To do that, we're going to plot the spike number histogram, which is shown here. On the vertical axis, we have the number of trials that contain n spikes, and on the horizontal axis, we have n, the number of spikes that we observe in a trial. On the previous trials that we in inspected, we saw 15 spikes in a few trials. I think we also saw 13 spikes, and we're able to construct this histogram by taking all of the trials and making a histogram of the spike counts across each trial. So that was the first number, the, the first uh, metric we used to characterize our data, the spike number histogram. <clears throat> Let's consider a second metric, the firing rate. We define the firing rate, little r, as the number of spikes per second in a single trial. There's an equation we can use to define the firing rate. Let's define little r is equal to little n over big T. We remember little n is the number of spikes in a trial, and we're going to divide that by t, the duration of the trial. We also defined a quantity, the average firing rate, where here we write r inside of these angular brackets, and we set that equal to the number of spikes per second averaged across all trials. The equation for the average firing rate what we'll compute in this case is the average number of spikes per trial. We'll denote that by n, again, with these angular brackets. And we'll divide this quantity, the average number of spikes per trial, by the total duration of a trial, big T. Note the units for the firing rate or the average firing rate are in spikes per second or hertz. Remember, one over seconds is hertz. The third quantity we computed to characterize our spike train data is the interspike interval histogram. Well, let's remember first, what is an interspike interval? The ISI, or interspike interval, is the time between spikes, which we've denoted here in this figure by the horizontal blue line. Our goal in the interspike interval histogram is to visualize the list of all ISIs, interspike intervals, for all trials. Here's an example interspike interval histogram, where notice our axes in this case, we're plotting on the uh, vertical axis, the number of times each ISI is observed, and on the horizontal axis, the ISIs that we do observe. Notice the units of ISIs in this case are in milliseconds. Now looking at the ISI histogram in this case, we could start to ask interesting questions. For example, what's the largest ISI we observe in this figure? Right, if we inspect this, can we find the largest ISI? Well, when I look at this, it appears that we do have an ISI out near 300 milliseconds. What's the smallest ISI observed? Well, it's hard to tell on the scale of this figure, but it looks to be very tiny, very close in this case to zero milliseconds. Now, does that seem reasonable? A zero millisecond ISI for a physical neuron? Something to consider. What's the most common ISI we observe? Well, that would be the ISI that has the highest number of counts, or the highest number of times that we observe it. In this case, it again appears to be a very small ISI near zero. We might also ask, questions and decide whether or not they're relevant, like what is the mean ISI? What is the average ISI we observe? That's something you might think about. A fourth characterization we use to describe our data is the rastergram. And the rastergram provides a visual way to display the spiking activity over all trials in time. So here is an example rastergram. We're notice on the vertical axis, we're plotting the trial number. In this case, we have 200 trials versus time. In this case, our half second of data from time zero all the way up to time 500 milliseconds. Each dot in this figure indicates a spike. So if we locate a dot in here, if we locate a particular dot, that corresponds to a dot at a particular trial number at a particular time. So this is the rastergram. It provides a way for us to visualize all of our data at once, and it can be very useful uh, to get a, a kind of a global view of what's happening in these data. And it can be particularly useful if something's gone wrong in our data. For example, what if we observe no spikes? Right? Or for example, what if we observe some spikes for the first half uh, of time and then no spikes for the second half of time? How do we interpret that in our data? Finally, the last measure we considered to characterize our data is called the post-stimulus time histogram. And the idea of this PSTH, or post-stimulus time histogram, is to plot the firing rate versus time. 
So here's an example, PSTH. We're plotting the PSTH on the vertical axis and then the time in milliseconds on the horizontal axis. Now we can ask questions about the PSTH in this case. For example, how does this cell respond to the stimulus? Notice the stimulus occurs at time zero, and what we observe in this case is that at some interval following the stimulus, in this case 100 milliseconds following the stimulus, we have this large increase in the firing rate. So we deliver our stimulus to our cell, there's a pause of 100 milliseconds, it then spikes for 100 to 300 milliseconds, and then turns off again. Another question, what are the units of the PSTH? I haven't labeled them here, but we probably should. What are those units? Again, something to think about. So as an example of the application of our visualization and data analysis techniques, we consider the, uh, the so-called Halle Berry cell. And here's an example, experimental representation of this Halle Berry cell. What's happening in this experiment? A human subject is being presented with visual stimuli. And these visual stimuli are shown in the top row of this figure. Now what's being recorded is the spiking activity of an individual neuron in response to this visual stimuli. And these responses are shown using some of the visualization techniques we've developed. So for example, what we observe here is a rastergram of this neuron following presentation of the visual stimuli where each row in this rastergram corresponds to an individual column, and these tick marks correspond to spike times. So that's shown in the second row of this figure. We have a series of rastergrams for these different stimuli presentations. And then what is this thing on the bottom row of the figure? It should look familiar. We were just talking about it. It's the post-stimulus time histogram. Where here what's being shown is the time following the stimulus. Uh, where the stimulus corresponds to this first vertical blue line. We then have the PSTH, the instantaneous firing rate, plotted as a function of time. And we can look at these figures and try to draw a scientific conclusion. For example, to which pictures does this neuron respond? If we look at these pictures, perhaps we can convince ourselves that this particular neuron responds to visual uh, images that correspond to this couple, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. And notice they can have these, uh, they could be in different locations, uh, with or without sunglasses, maybe with different hairstyles, but the cell still responds, is still somehow able to capture the notion of this couple. While if you just show this cell uh, one of the members of the couple, Jennifer Aniston, you instead uh, do not find a change in the firing rate. So here's an example application of these tools that we've learned in this course to a real world problem in neuroscience. What do neurons encode? In addition to our data analysis methods, which are useful for summarizing the activity of a neuron, we also considered examples of neural models at different levels of detail. So let's return to our data. For example, the activity recorded from a single neuron. Here's an example voltage recording where we have voltage plotted on the vertical axis and then time along the horizontal axis. And what we observe in this case are a lot of spikes or action potentials. And we can start to ask scientific questions. For example, what are the mechanisms that could possibly generate this observed activity. And we considered a variety of these models, verbal models and statistical models, then moving up to dynamical and biophysical models, and then very detailed biophysical models. So let's consider these models uh, sequentially. Let's start with a verbal model, where we might say, as a model of our neuron, we could say that this neuron generates action potentials, or spikes, at approximately a steady rate. And that's our model, that's our verbal, verbal model, it does capture some notion of this neuron's activity. It does generate action potentials. We could see that here in the figure. And the rate is approximately steady. If we were to divide this up into smaller intervals, we might say that the number of spikes at the beginning of this activity is about the same as the number of spikes at the end. So it's an approximately steady rate. Now what are the advantages of this verbal model? Well, it's very easy to create. Right? We were able to simply create it by writing down and uh, saying that sentence. Possible disadvantage is that this model is inexact and imprecise. What do we mean by approximately steady rate? And it's not very quantitative. It doesn't tell us anything about the mechanisms that could be generating this spiking activity. A second type of modeling approach that we considered, uh, we called the statistical model. Now to construct this model, this very simple model of spiking, we started by dividing the time axis into tiny subintervals, and that's what's shown here where we can imagine a stimulus is presented at some time, and then we're taking our time axis, this blue line, and dividing it up into many tiny sub-intervals. Our model then consisted of a coin flip. We imagine flipping a coin and asking whether or not a spike occurs in each sub-interval. And maybe this coin is biased. 
So for example, we take our first interval, we flip a coin, we get a T. We go to the next interval, we flip a coin, we get a T. Another interval, we flip a coin and get a T, and so on. Every once in a while, we observe an H here, but for the most part, we observe Ts. So again, in every sub-interval, we flip our biased coin. We might call this the coin flip model. Now, why did I say that this coin is biased? Why did I make that claim? Well, looking at the sequences of Ts and Hs that we observe here, we get mostly Ts and only a couple of Hs. And we might guess that if this were a fair coin and we were flipping it, we would expect to see approximately the same number of Ts and Hs as we did lots and lots of flips. And that doesn't appear to be the case here. So it's a pretty safe bet that we're working with a biased coin. Then, the probability of observing n spikes in a trial, where we divide up our trial into lots and lots of these tiny intervals, the probability of observing n spikes in this trial, we represent it in two different ways. If m is small, where m is the number of sub-intervals, we can use the binomial distribution to write down the probability of observing n spikes. Or, we can use the Poisson distribution when m is big. When we, lot, when we have lots and lots and lots of sub-intervals, we have this approximation to the binomial distribution, the probability, big P, of observing n spikes, and we got this relationship that we were able to show. Now one note is that these two distributions are the same, but the Poisson distribution is more convenient when m gets very large. And you might go back and think about what happens to this binomial distribution when m gets large, and why is that a challenge in this case? Let's now consider a third type of model, a biophysical model. And let's start with some biological facts. We'll begin with a very simple cartoon representation of a neuron, which is drawn here as a circle. And here's the first fa fact that we can use. There's an excess negative charge inside the neuron. And we can represent that in this cartoon graphically by drawing a lot of negative charges inside of the cell. These negative charges are repelling one another. They're trying to get as far apart as possible. And what happens is that these charges pile up on the interior of the cell membrane. Now, because we have all of these positive charges piling up in the cell membrane, they attract equal and opposite positive charge from the extracellular space outside of the neuron. So we have this equal and opposite positive charge now piled up on the outside of our neuron. And we could think of this as an equivalent circuit and represent this simple representation of the neural membrane as a capacitor. And we've drawn a capacitor here on the left. This capacitor has an upper plate. We can consider that the inside of our cell, it has a negative charge minus Q. And on the bottom plate, the lower plate, there's an equal and opposite charge of plus Q. Between these upper and lower plates, we have an insulator through which charge cannot pass. Just like in our cell membrane, uh, we have this lipid bilayer through which the charge cannot pass. One equation, the most important equation for our capacitor, is this equation that relates the charge to the voltage. Q is equal to CV, where Q is the charge on the upper and lower plates. We have plus on the bottom plate in this case and minus on the upper plate. V is the voltage across the capacitor, and C is the capacitance, which represents some physical properties. We can think of this as representing some property of our cell membrane. So notice in this case, we've gone from a biophysical idea, some biological facts, this charge separation across the cell membrane, eventually to a mathematical equation, this capacitor rule, Q is equal to CV. More biological facts. Now our cell membrane is not this impermeable lipid bilayer that would be pretty boring because charge cannot go in or go out of the cell. Instead, our cell membrane has holes in it or channels in the cell membrane. And we'll draw that here as this opening in the cell membrane. Now what's important about these openings in the cell membrane is that they allow ions to pass in and out of the neuron. So imagine in this case we have our excess of negative charge inside of the neuron. We have this equal and opposite positive charge outside of the neuron. Now we can allow these positive charges to leave the interior of the neuron and go out into the extracellular space. Now this charge flow through the cell membrane we can represent as an equivalent circuit and we could think of these holes in the membrane as resistors. We've drawn a resistor here, it's a squiggly line, and we can imagine this squiggly line is, has a wire attached on top and on bottom. Now what's important about this relationship, thinking about uh, this resistor, is that we can write down a mathematical equation that relates the voltage across this resistor to the current flowing through it. 
So here's the resistor rule. We have V, the voltage across the resistor, is equal to I, the current flowing through this resistor, times R, the resistance, some physical property of the resistor. Now this is related to our cell. We have V, some voltage difference across our cell membrane. We have I, we have charge moving, a current flow through the cell. And then we have some property of this cell membrane, the resistance, or how big or small. We can think of that as how big or small is this channel through which ions can flow. Also, it's useful when we're thinking about these types of models uh, to consider this case where we're able to inject current into our neuron. And we can imagine that in this cartoon representation that we have an electrode. We stick that electrode into our neuron and we can inject charges inside of our cell. Now these biological facts we can use to create an equivalent circuit. So here's the equivalent circuit. We started on the left with our cartoon representation of the cell membrane. We had charge separation. We have ions that can flow through holes in the cell membrane. And here's the corresponding equivalent circuit. We're notice in this case, in the equivalent circuit, we have a resistor, which is shown here, that corresponds to these holes in the cell membrane through which charges can flow. We have our capacitor, which represents this charge separation. Charge can pile up on one side of the capacitor and the other. There's an equal and opposite uh, charge on the sides of the capacitor, just like there's an equal and opposite charge on the sides of our cell membrane. And then there's some physical property of the capacitance. We also have an input current. This is shown at the top. This corresponds to the current we inject into our neuron. And what's valuable about going from our biological system, this cartoon representation at the left, to this equivalent circuit, which is shown at the right, is we can then take this equivalent circuit and convert it into a mathematical equation. And that mathematical equation is shown here. We have dV dt. How does the voltage change in time? Well, it's some function of the voltage itself minus V star divided by tau, where V star we defined as the target voltage, and it had a particular representation. We said it was equal to V rest plus R, the resistance, times the input current that we send into our uh, neuron. And then we divide that V star by tau, which is equal to RC, the resistance times the capacitance, and we call this the time constant. So again, the power of this approach, we started with our complicated biological system, we drew a cartoon, got to an equivalent circuit, and eventually wrote down a differential equation, a mathematical equation that we can then study. Again, this mathematical equation is motivated directly by the biophysics of our system. Now, we're almost there to our first biophysical model of a neuron. This equation is almost an integrate and fire neuron, but something very important is missing. What is the component that's missing? What do we need to add to this equation to get it to spike and generate our first spiking model? Well, we need to add in some conditional statements. So here is our definition of the leaky integrate and fire neuron, the LIF model. And we have two rules. If V is less than some threshold voltage, which we have to choose, then we're going to evolve V using that differential equation we just defined. This is the differential equation corresponding to that RC circuit. Now that equation holds and we evaluate this differential equation when V is less than V threshold. If, on the other hand, V becomes greater than or equal to V threshold, we do something else. Instead of evaluating this differential equation, when V is greater than or equal to V threshold, we set V equal to V reset. Where remember in this case, V threshold and V reset are parameters that we get to set and choose. So some things to notice here. This differential equation, dV dt, when V is small enough, when it's less than threshold, is motivated by our RC circuit that we defined in the previous slide. We also have this hack that we need to add to the model. And what this hack does is when the voltage becomes big enough, when V is greater than or equal to V threshold, uh, we reset it. We set it to some smaller value. And we say that when the voltage hits this threshold, the cell spikes. And that's the hack. We're not really modeling the spike here. We're just making this claim when the voltage becomes big enough, we'll just say that this neuron spiked and then we'll reset it. So in that sense, we're not really simulating what happens during a spike. We're just kind of passing over it with this hack. Now an interesting question we can consider, and a complicated question, is how does increasing the resistance affect the LIF model dynamics? Now, we can start by looking at the differential equation itself. Here it is, dV dt, we've said is equal to negative V minus the target voltage over tau. Now, I don't see any resistance terms in there. Where are the R's? 
Well, that's part of the trickiness of this uh, question is that those R's are hidden. Remember, the target voltage V star is equal to V rest plus the input current we inject times R. So we have an R in the numerator and tau is equal to R times C. So we have an R in the denominator. So it starts to get complicated. If we increase the resistance, we're increasing both the numerator and the denominator. So to answer this question, let's break it down into simpler pieces. First, let's consider how the target voltage changes as we increase R. Well, here's our expression for the target voltage. It's equal to V rest plus I input times R. There's the R. We're going to increase this R, which, going, uh, which will act to increase this second term. So the target voltage, it's the sum of these two terms. The first term stays the same. The second uh, term increases. What happens to the target voltage is we increase R. Our target voltage increases. Good. Now, what happens to the time constant? The time constant is here in the denominator. As we increase R, let's say we hold C the same, we're going to increase this time constant. Okay, and we can interpret this increase in time constant by noting that as uh, time constant increases as tau gets bigger and bigger and bigger, dv dt is going to get smaller, so v is going to change more slowly. Okay, so now a challenge question. Here's a plot of the voltage versus time for simulations of our RC circuit, part of the leaky integrate and fire model, although we have an it threshold in this case, so we're just simulating the RC circuit. Here are two different simulations, one shown in blue and the other one shown in red. We're plotting voltage versus time of our RC circuit, one of these curves corresponds to a larger value of R, the resistance. Which curve is it? Now it turns out in this case, the red curve corresponds to a big, bigger value of R, the resistance. How do we see this? Well, let's consider these two statements that we made regarding the target voltage and the time constant. Now, because the value of R is bigger, the target voltage is also bigger. We're drawing that target voltage here as this dotted uh, or dashed red line, V star. Notice that V is approaching V star. It's a big value. It's bigger than the blue curve. There's a higher target, a higher place where V is trying to go. It's trying to go to this target voltage, which we've increased above the blue curve by increasing R. Also, notice how long it takes V to get to this target. We can denote that uh, duration here with this red line. It takes from uh, about time zero to time 80 in the simulation before this initial red point eventually reaches the uh, target voltage V star. So it takes a long time to get there. It's slow for V to arrive at its target. And that also corresponds to a larger value of R. We said that when R is bigger, the time constant is also bigger and V changes more slowly. Now the blue curve again corresponds to a smaller value of R. It has a lower target voltage. Right, this blue line, we'll draw it here as V star. Here's the target voltage. It's lower than the uh, red case because R is smaller. And also, notice how quickly V goes from its initial value to the target voltage. In this case, it maybe takes 15 or 25 uh, time steps, milliseconds in this case, for the uh, blue curve to reach its asymptote. So for this case, for the smaller value of R, we have a lower target voltage, a lower target voltage because this R is smaller, and V changes more quickly because this denominator tau is smaller. So dV dt is bigger because this denominator is smaller. So V quickly gets to its target voltage. Okay, in the previous slide, we considered some mathematical intuition for why increasing the uh, resistance of our cell impacts the LIF model dynamics and specifically the dynamics of the RC circuit. Let's consider now some more biophysical intuition uh, for this behavior. So here's the, here's the essential idea, the main intuition. At equilibrium, when V reaches its target voltage, V star, the current injected, which we control, equals the current flowing out through the channel. So let's think about that statement graphically and draw some pictures. And we'll first consider the case where the resistance R is big. And we can represent that graphically by drawing our cell membrane. It's impermeable to charge, putting a tiny channel in it. We're drawing a tiny channel here, a small hole, to indicate that there's lots of resistance. It's harder to get charged to scoot through this tiny hole in our cell membrane. So this small channel is me uh, meant to represent graphically a big resistance. There's lots of resistance, hard to get charged through this little uh, hole in the membrane. Now what we're going to do is we're going to inject positive charges into this neuron. 
eventually will reach equilibrium when the charge we inject into this cell equals the charge that flows out through this tiny channel. Now in this case, we're gonna to have to inject lots and lots of positive charge inside of this neuron. This positive charge, it doesn't like to be next to each other. We have all of these equal charges of the same sign, they're resisting each other and they're trying to get as far away from each other as possible. And you can imagine, perhaps, if you have lots and lots of charges in here, they're pushing each other all over the place. And eventually, if you have enough positive charges in here, those pushes are going to be so strong, they're going to send positive charges out through this tiny channel. And because there's so much force acting on these uh, positive charges, we might get a strong flow through this tiny channel. And in order to reach this state, where the charge we inject is equal to the charge that, throws out, that flows out through this tiny channel, we'll need to inject lots and lots of positive charge into our neuron. And this is gonna take a lot of time. So it's gonna take longer for us to reach equilibrium before we inject enough positive charges in here that they're repelling each other so much, the amount of charge that leaves through this highly resistive channel equals the amount of charge that we inject. Now let's compare that to a second case where the resistance through this channel is small. And we'll represent that graphically by drawing a big hole in our cell membrane. Now again, we can consider the case where we inject positive charges to our neuron. <clears throat> and we wanna know, when do we reach equilibrium? When do we reach the case that the current we inject through our uh, electrode is equal to the current that flows out through this channel? Now we might expect in this case, we only need to inject a few charges into our neuron. Again, these positive charges are all repelling each other. They wanna get away from each other as far apart as possible. So it won't take long before we inject enough charges that the amount of charge we inject in through our electrode is able to escape through this giant channel. So we're able to reach equilibrium faster. We're able to reach the point where the charge we inject is equal to the charge that flows out through this channel with only a few charges inside of our cell. And perhaps this gives more biophysical intuition why a high resistance, it takes us longer to get there because we need more positive charges inside of our cell before the charge flowing in is equal to the charge flowing out. Well, when the resistance is small, we have this big channel, it doesn't take long for us to, us to reach the state where the charge flowing in is equal to the charge flowing out through this giant channel. So again, it takes a longer time to get to this state. We need more positive charges in this big resistance case. We don't need as many positive charges in this small resistance case. It takes a, a shorter time to get there. Finally, the last biophysical model that we considered in detail here was the Hodgkin-Huxley model. In this model, there are two main types of ions, potassium ions and sodium ions. We talked about the concentration of these ions inside and outside of the neuron. The concentration of potassium is higher inside of our uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model neuron, while the, the concentration of sodium is higher outside of our uh, membrane. There are different channels in this cell membrane. Uh, we have channels that are permeable to potassium, channels that are permeable to sodium. And the main idea and the main innovation of this Hodgkin-Huxley model is that these channels open and close in time. And we had to update our model dynamics to include this opening and closing of these uh, membrane channels. So to construct our biophysical model, we first created an equivalent circuit. And that equivalent circuit is shown here. In this equivalent circuit, we worried about the flow of three different types, or actually four different types of currents. We had our potassium current, which is flowing through part of our uh, membrane. It had its own battery here and its own resistor. This resistor is variable, and that's what's indicated by this arrow. This arrow. We had a sodium current, which co corresponds to the flow of sodium ions. It also had its own battery, which is shown here. And again, this uh, resistance is changing in time, so that's indicated by the arrow. We also had a leak current shown here. It doesn't change in time. There's no arrow on this resistor. It has its own battery. We had an input current that we inject to our neuron. And then we also have this capacitive current, which corresponds to charges that pile up on the uh, inside and outside of our capacitor. We think of the inside of the cell as the top part of this figure and the outside of the cell is the bottom part of this figure where we've set it to ground uh, equal to zero by convention. From this equivalent circuit, we were able to write down a differential equation, and that differential equation is shown here. So notice that this differential equation, we have a bunch of different terms. We have our input current, we have our potassium current, n to the fourth, we have our sodium current, which has two different gating variables, m and h, where we have m cubed, and then we have our leak current. Now these different gates, n, m, and h, have their own differential equations. 
and we thought about the uh, dynamics of these gating variables as well. They all have the same form, but we have to be very careful to think about the shapes of these uh, steady state functions, the n infinity, m infinity, and h infinity terms, as well as the time constants, tau n, tau m, and tau h. So we have our system of differential equations. It's four coupled differential equations, one for the voltage dynamics, three for the gating dynamics. This fourth order system lives in a four dimensional space, voltage, V, N, M, and H are three gates. So it's much harder to study compared to our initial leaky integrate and fire model. And that's the price we pay to get a more biophysically realistic neuron. So here's an example of our Hodgkin and Huxley neuron evolving in time. So what's being shown in this figure is we're injecting a tiny uh, blip of current and that's enough to induce a spike. So what's being plotted in the second panel is voltage versus time. Now what happens during a spike? Our M gate rapidly swings open. As this M gate swings open, uh, sodium ions rush into our neuron. So we can see this M gate swinging open and we can see these sodium ions going into the neuron, negative by convention. Now this M gate swinging open is followed by the H gate swinging closed. And what's the effect of this H gate swinging closed? It reduces the flow of our sodium ions. So we can see that flow reducing here, the conductance going down. At the same time, our N gate is opening. This is allowing potassium ions to flow out of our neuron. We can see our N gate is opening up. Potassium ions start to flow out of our neuron. And this N conductance, G, K, is now open. And so what's important here, we have this very complicated set of differential equations that's able to generate a rapid action potential. Notice this occurs within a, a millisecond or two, this rapid increase and decrease in voltage. We can look at how these variables evolve and we can give them a biophysical interpretation of these gates swinging open and close, allowing ions to flow in and out of our neuron and generating this rapid increase and decrease in the voltage during a spike. So let's step back a minute and think about the tools and the models we've learned and instances in which they apply. So here's a particular example. How do neurons spike during a human seizure? So these are recordings from a microelectrode array that's implanted into a human subject. And what's being plotted here are a bunch of different neurons. This neuron ranking corresponds to approximately 150 neurons as a function of time where a seizure starts at time zero. What is this a picture of? It's a rastrogram and it's giving us a sense for how these neurons behave during a seizure. As another example, application of these techniques, how do neurons encode memories? This is work done here locally at BU in the Eichenbaum lab. And what's happening here is a rat is running down a maze. It has to do two different events that are separated by some delay. Again, we won't go into the details here, but here are some figures from that paper. What do these figures correspond to? Well, again, we're seeing rastergrams shown here in the gray shaded boxes. And if you had to guess, what do you think these gray curves or this red and green curve correspond to. Well, they look like PSTHs, right? The post-stimulus time histogram or the instantaneous firing rate. Uh, we can see how that evolves, how this firing rate increases and decreases uh, corresponding to our rastergrams. So again, the tools we're learning here are applied in modern research in neuroscience. Another example, so this is work again done at BU uh, with Nancy Capel. Michelle McCarthy here at BU, as well as former grad students and collaborators, also other faculty here at BU, collaborators at MIT. So here's an example of an equation from that paper. Uh, what does this equation look like? I mean, maybe without going into all the details, we could see some of the familiar signatures of our Hodgkin-Huxley model. We have an equation representing how voltage changes in time. We have a bunch of different currents. These currents have gating variables, which have a familiar form. Simulations of that model are represented in a particular way. Again, we're seeing a rastogram here, spiking versus time. So again, the models we develop are used in modern research in neuroscience. Okay, and again, the big picture motivation in this course. We have data, we have ways to analyze and make sense of that data, and then we have models. And you're learning the tools that are employed in the field by researchers, mathematicians, statisticians, neuroscientists, psychologists, clinicians trying to understand the brain. And you're also learning the language of computational neuroscience, MATLAB. And with that, good luck on the exam. I'm sure you'll do great.